Okay, so the fundamental theorem of calculus, one of the most important topics in calculus one. We'll continue it today. If you remember sort of the structure we put on it yesterday, we said that the fundamental theorem has a part one and a part two. And part one was, okay, suppose you have a function that's defined in this kind of funky way. And I tried to convince you that this isn't really funky, that there are very natural functions that would be defined like this. But in any event, what I said then was, oh, you can take the derivative of this, no sweat. Essentially, the derivative gets rid of the integral and just leaves you with that function to the right of the integral sign. Part one's important, but you don't use it sort of on a daily basis because part one does require you to have a function that's defined in this very specific way. Part two. is the part of the fundamental theorem that everyone kind of thinks about when they hear that phrase. Part two is the piece of the fundamental theorem that gets used on a day-to-day -day basis in calculus two. And that's because this part of the fundamental theorem is a two for evaluating definite integrals. We define these definite integrals as a limit. We said, okay, this limit's terrible. We don't want to actually find definite integrals this way. So how do we find definite integrals? Well, there are actually a number of answers to that, but the simplest answer is to use part two of, of the fundamental theorem. So suppose we have a definite integral, and suppose we can find an antiderivative of the function we are looking at. So suppose we can find a function capital F of X, such that the derivative of capital F of X is lowercase F of X. Then to find this definite integral, we plug in f of b, we plug in f of a, and we subtract. And that's all there is to it. Although I don't want to go too far. I mean, when I say that's all there is to it, Notice that to you is the fundamental theorem of calculus. You need to be able to find this function, capital F of X. So you need to be able to find an antiderivative of lowercase f of X. And that is not necessarily a trivial thing to do. Um, we're not going to prove 
part two of the fundamental theorem, but we are going to try to give a real world example to show that this makes sense. In particular, let's say that something is moving and that something is moving with a positive velocity. So it's never changing direction in particular. And suppose we have an integral from one to three of this function. Well, the integral from one to three, because we're assuming that this function is positive, is the area under the curve. And we've already said as an application of the area under the curve, that the area under a velocity curve is the distance the object travels. So if time is measured in seconds, let's say, this is the distance the object travels between the first and the third second. Now, the velocity is the derivative of the position function. So my claim, or the fundamental theorem of calculus is claim, is that this integral is S of minus s of one, where s is the position function. So here's the position at t equals one. Here's the position at t equals three, how far does the object travel to get from s of one to s of three? Well, which travel is the difference? It travels s of three minus s of one. So, these things line up. This area under the velocity curve is this difference. It is S of three minus S of one, because this and this are both ways of answering the question, how far does the object travel between the first and the third second. So the fundamental theorem of calculus, without formally proving it, at least appears to be true in this concrete situation. And I wouldn't lie to you, it is true in general. And the fundamental theorem of calculus then provides a way for evaluating definite integrals. Um, before I get to that, by the way, um, we're finally in a position to see why we're using this word integral two different times. I mean, we have the definite integral, which is a weird limit. And we have an indefinite integral, which is the antiderivatives. And when you first see the weird limit and the antiderivatives, you think, 
Why are these both called integrals? They're completely different concepts. But now in part two of the fundamental theorem, we see that they're actually very closely linked together because to find the definite integral, you need the antiderivatives. In other words, to find the definite integral, you need to find the indefinite integral. So very closely related concepts, even though they don't look that way at first glance. We can now look at something like the integral from one to three of x squared dx. We've already looked at this thing or something very like it graphically. We've said, okay, this is the area under the curve, but now we're in a position to actually evaluate this without um, messing around with ugly limits. And to evaluate this, we need n antiderivative. I say n antiderivative. Every continuous function has infinitely many antiderivatives. Um, having said that, When we're finding these definite integrals, when we're using the fundamental theorem of calculus, we, we don't really need to worry about this bus term. <laughs> we can just use one third x cubed. And that's because according to what we have written here, any antiderivative should work, right? So if one third x cubed works, why would we want one third x cubed minus four or whatever? Why would we want a more complicated function when a simpler function works? So when we're using the fundamental theorem that we go as far as to just erase this, we don't need to worry about the plus C. And now we plug in three, we plug in one, and we subtract them. And there's special notation for this, but for this first example, let me just write this. One third, three cubed, I make that 27 over three. One, three, one cubed. Now that's one over three. And the fundamental theorem says you just take these numbers and subtract them. So this definite integral, the area under this curve is 26 over three. I um, 
I took this antiderivative fairly quickly. I gave you a lengthy antiderivative quiz, so I hope you sort of took the time to try to really nail that down, because we're going to be using antiderivatives a lot in calculus from here on out. I already said we don't need to bother with this plus C. What if I did? What if I said, okay, one third X cubed plus five is an antiderivative. Let's use that. Well, when you plugged in three, you'd get that plus five. And when you plugged in one, you'd get that plus five. So when you subtracted, you get 27 over three plus five minus one over three plus five your plus fives cancel out. You've got a five minus a five. And you wind up at exactly the same place, 26 over three. So driving home, what I said earlier, there's really never any point when you're using the fundamental theorem to having a plus C term in your antiderivative. Question so far. Then let's get a bit of notation down. <clears throat> notation. So we have an integral from A to B of some function and we're using the fundamental theorem of calculus. We found this function capital F of X. Capital F of X is an antiderivative of lowercase f of x. This thing here gets special notation. We write the function. We write a vertical bar next to the function. And then sort of similar to the integral notation, I guess, um, to the, at the bottom of that vertical bar, we write A, at the top of that vertical bar, we write to B. So, going back to the problem, we just did the integral from, let me remind myself, the integral from one to three of x squared dx. We write, okay, one third x cubed vertical bar one, three. And then that equals um, 27 thirds minus one third. 
Um, we just do this, I guess, for compactness and sort of for neatness, but it's a very standard notation. Again, this is something we'll just be using from here on out. So in spite of the fundamental theorem being, being one of the most important things in calculus, there's kind of a limited class of things that I can actually say about it at this point in time, at least. We just need we just need for you to do examples, which I know, you know, when you sort of uh, always discouraging, but it's a super long quiz, but this isn't material you can get away with not learning. This really is foundational. So we can do a few examples. We can take the integral from zero to pi of the sine of x dx. And to evaluate these definite integrals, you need the antiderivative. That's really the hard part of the problem. I mean, once you have the antiderivative, you're just plugging numbers in and then subtracting on your calculator. So, actually, For our very second example, let me make this as straightforward as possible and put a little negative sign in front of that sign. And the reason I'm doing that is to make the antiderivative as straightforward as possible. The derivative of the cosine is the negative sign. So an antiderivative of the negative sign is the cosine. And we are evaluating from zero to pi. So the cosine of pi minus the cosine of zero. And let me think about this. The cosine of pi is negative one. You could, if you don't remember your, your unit circle trigonometry, you could always just plug that into your calculator, but it is negative one. The cosine of zero is positive one, negative one minus one is negative two. Um, then we, it's perfectly fine, by the way. I mean, we have this negative definite integral that happens because Remember that, that the integral is the weighted area under the curve. So if your function is negative, it makes sense that we're getting a negative definite integral. Um, the integral from zero to pi of three. Oh, no, I don't, I 
need to be really careful with the secant because the secant is okay. Change in plan. Change in plan. Let's change that from a secant to a cosine. Um, the reason, by the way, I mean, we're getting a little ahead of my, ourselves, but it's not like it's a secret. I was going to write the secant, and then I thought, hold on, to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, we need this function to be continuous. And I thought, is the secant continuous from zero to pi? And it definitely isn't. It has vertical asymptotes. So that's why I changed it. But three times the cosine. Um, if that three is bothering us, we can just drag it out of the definite integral. Here's where we start using those rules we presented yesterday. We put them on the board and then we couldn't really use them because we didn't know how to find any definite integrals. But constants, you can just pull out of it the rules. So that three can sit in front. The antiderivative of the cosine is what? I hear a negative sign. Any other thoughts? Okay, so this isn't like end of the world, but this is stuff that you at, um, that you do need to know and be able to sort of rattle off without a huge amount of thought. So the derivative of the sine is the cosine, ergo an antiderivative of the cosine is the sine. Uh, but but thank you for your uh, participation. No negative signs here, but I do appreciate that you spoke up. So we're taking the sign from zero to pi. The sine of pi minus the sign of zero. And now again, depending on, on how confident you are in your unit circle trigonometry, you might be able to do this in your head or you might have to go to your calculator, but whichever you do, you're going to find that the sine of pi and the sine of zero are both to zero. Three minus zero is zero. So this definite integral is zero. The positive area and the negative area are perfectly canceling each other out. Looking at another example, the integral from one to three of x squared plus two x minus one dx. The lesson of this example is that even when, if you can use linearity, you don't necessarily want to. And in fact, I would say you usually don't because yesterday we learned 
oh, you can take the integral of a sum and a difference. We can just break it apart into three integrals. And you can do that. I'm not saying you can't, but it's almost certainly not how we want to tackle this problem. Um, it's probably increasing our workload a lot to do that. We probably just want to take the antiderivative of this. And we do remember that when we're taking antiderivatives of a sum or of subtraction, we just do it piece by piece. One third x cubed plus x squared. Um, from, we bump the power up and then we divide by it. But we have this two here, so two divided by two just goes away. The antiderivative of one or n antiderivative, I guess I should say, but the simplest antiderivative of one is x. And now um, these problems can turn a little tedious when you've found the antiderivative and then you're looking at this big polynomial and it's like, okay, stick three in there, stick one in there and subtract. It's not complicated what we want to do. We want to stick in the three. Three cubed is 27. Three squared is nine. Three is three. And then we subtract. Make sure you use parentheses appropriately. We stick in one. We get one third plus one minus one. So now it's just kind of tedious. We can either do this in our head or we can go stick it in a calculator. I would probably just use the calculator. Um, well, I would use the calculator except that I don't have this calculator wrap booted up. So let's see if we can do it in our head by the time that boots up. 27 over three plus six minus one over three. This one and this negative one cancel. Um, so 26 over three plus six is 18 over three. So I make this 26, 36, 40, If my hasty mental arithmetic hasn't led me astray, I make that 44 over 3. 
Let me see. I know this is slightly tedious. It is slightly tedious. Well, but it can't be helped. Some things do just need practice and there is nothing you can do that's going to make it all that exciting. So to use the fundamental theorem, we are assuming something. I didn't write it down. Let me very explicitly write it down now. I did say it out loud, but I want you to have this in your notes. To use the fundamental theorem, that function f of x should be continuous. So this secant times the tangent could potentially be a problem because <laughs> if I go Come on, work with me. If I go to desmos.com and let me share this. And I look at the secant of X times the tangent of X. This thing is not continuous everywhere. This thing has vertical asymptotes, spaces where this function is just not defined. So like if I were trying to take the integral from zero to four, I would not be able to do that using the fundamental theorem of calculus because there is this big old hole right in the middle of that interval. Now from point one to point two, that issue does not arise. Here is this function on that interval. It's certainly continuous here. So we go ahead and we hit this with the fundamental theorem. And again, I hope I haven't done you wrong by giving you all of this take home stuff. Um, maybe I've made you think, okay, I can just look this up when I need it. No need to memorize anything, but you do not want to be in a position where you cannot take elementary antiderivatives and you have to look them up every time they appear. That would be a very difficult position to be in, especially once calculus two starts. So the secant times the tangent ought to look familiar to you. It's the derivative of the secant. The derivative of the secant is the secant times the tangent. Therefore, the secant is an antiderivative of the secant times the tangent. And your calculator, does your calculator have a secant button? I actually do not know the answer to that 
question. Your cultivator does not have a dedicated seeking button, but that's fine because the seeking is one divided by the cosine. So the secant of point two is one divided by the cosine of point two. And the secant of point one is one divided by the cosine of point one. And this is therefore a few button presses, but we can go to our calculator and type one divided by the cosine of point two. Minus one divided by the cosine of point one and get this definite integral point zero one five three. I'm, by the way, I mean, I'm a big fan of just rounding and getting decimal answers because calculus, I mean, it's taught as a math, well, it is a math class, but it's really an applied class. You learn calculus usually for its applications. And I mean, I've touched on this before, I think, but you know, the secant of point two minus the secant of point one might be a very accurate answer, but it's not an answer anyone can use in any kind of applied context. If you're ordering stuff or measuring stuff, a decimal is almost certainly the way to go. So we're not really, well, we're very close to being done with this chapter, but we haven't really looked at, and what we'll look at tomorrow is sort of concrete applications of all of this. The textbook has something it calls the net change. Theorem. And the net change theorem is just, just in scare quotes, but it's just the fundamental theorem of calculus applied to various real world changes and real world situations. So tomorrow we'll look at some applications of all of this to justify the statement I just made that calculus is an applied field. And I will see you then, bright and early.